that said, let's get into the Word in Mark chapter 16. I'll begin reading at verse 15. I'll read to verse 18. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now, as I've been doing throughout our, our, our journey through Mark, is I've been alluding to other portions of Scripture, which is what I'm going to do today. I'm going to be reading out of and, and sharing about this commission that's being given to the, uh, the, the apostles. Um, I'll be alluding to that out of Matthew 28. But what we have here in Mark's gospel is Jesus giving marching orders to his men. Everything in this gospel has been leading to this, to this final action. Now, as we've been going through the gospel of Mark, we've seen that the apostle had been commanded to go to Galilee. We saw that in Mark 16, verses 6 and 7, where it says that an angel commanded the women to go tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead and going before them to Galilee, and there they would see him. Well, after the angel commanded them to tell his disciples, Jesus appeared to them. Matthew 28, 10 says that Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So in obedience to Jesus, as men had left Jerusalem, they went up north into the Galilee. So they were waiting to, to meet with him, even as the Lord had commanded them to do. Now, we already saw how that, while awaiting him, Jesus had met with seven of the men. He met with them on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee as they were fishing. We looked at that recently, and it was at that time that Peter was restored to ministry. So what we're looking at today took place after Jesus restored Peter to his ministry. So at this point... The remaining faithful men have come to meet with Jesus. Matthew 28, 16 says, The eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them, to the mountain. Now, Jesus often in the Gospels is recorded as ministering to his men on a mountain. It was on a mountain, for example, that he gave what we call the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7. It was while on a mountain he, he chose the 12, according to Mark 3.13. The feeding of the 5,000 took place at the foot of a mountain in John 6. The transfiguration occurred on a mountain in Matthew 17. We know of the Mount of Olives discourse that you find in 24 and 25 of Matthew, chapter 24 and 25. It was on the Mount of Olives that he wept over Jerusalem, according to Luke 19. And ultimately, he ascended to heaven from the Mount of Olives. So, this is also a place that is a mountain. Yet, notice with me, it's unnamed. But it's on this, this unnamed mountain that he gives the Great Commission. Now, just so that you know, some believe that this particular commission was being given to him, to them rather, from the same place that he gave the Sermon on the Mount. But there's no... Uh, biblical evidence of that, but many suppose that that may very well be the same place he's doing that. But it's here, on this particular spot, that the apostles, as well as we, the church, are receiving marching orders. So they, as well as we, are to be witnesses who share the gospel with other people. Now, it seems to me, and it's very clear to most of us, that there are many professing Christians who have misunderstood this particular mandate. They, they've not realized that the command was given not just the apostles, but they were given to us too. For many of the church, for many in the church, um, well, they'll attend occasionally church services because that may meet some of their particular needs, and it escapes them that they have been given a, a mission, and this mission that that people who attend church have, have failed to understand is the greatest mission. It's of supreme urgency. We are to share the message of salvation, and we're to live as if we received it ourselves and have been saved. And we're to proclaim the message. 
But the message is to be proclaimed with a goal. And the goal is not just to preach a message. The goal is to make disciples. The commission is to go into the whole world. And that's important to note because we are to go into the whole world. The apostles were to go into the whole world, not just to the nation of Israel. You see, when Jesus originally trained them, they were first sent only to the Jews. In Matthew 10, 5 and 6, it says, These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In Luke chapter 10, when he had appointed 70 others, he sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. So they would go out, but they would go out to the house of Israel. And so now, according to verse 15, they're to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to everybody. Why? Because God doesn't desire any to perish, but that all should come to repentance. When Isaiah was writing in Isaiah 45, verse 22, it reads there, Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. And so they're to go, the church, by application, but they are to go into all the world and preach the gospel, to herald the good news. Psalm 96, verse 3 says, Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. So they're to go forth, and they do so with the authority and the intent of being listened to and to be obeyed. So what we do is we proclaim the message of salvation, and what we also do is we encourage people to turn to the Lord. We point people to Jesus Christ. We, we reveal to, to them that, that he came to die, that we might live. That's what we just celebrated recently when we gathered together for for Easter services, that Jesus Christ came, he lived, he performed works, he, he died on a cross, and he was raised from the dead. And, and we proclaim that. That's the, the core of the gospel. We talk about the death of Christ so that he might purchase us, redeem us, r ransom us out of sin, to take us out of the power and sway of the enemy, to no longer live as if we were still in the world and, and just being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. What we are called by God to do is to be transformed. We can be so through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that message has come to us because we know that salvation is in Christ alone. In Acts 4, 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. So the gospel, the gospel is the greatest message that could ever be proclaimed. We proclaim in that message that God has so loved the world that he gave his son. We proclaim in that message that, that God provides forgiveness for our sins through Jesus Christ. We're just in Romans 5, just this last week, in chapter 5, verses 8 through 10, and I was teaching out of these verses, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from, the wrath, through, from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life." And so Mark tells us, go into all the world. Now, the command, and I want you to see this in verse 15, he simply says, go into all the world and to preach the gospel. That's Mark's abbreviation of the commission. Matthew gives us more. Matthew tells us what we are to do as we go into all the world. In Matthew 28, 19, and 20, go therefore, make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, I want to take a moment to develop this with you. I've said this on various occasions, how that the em emphasis in the verse when he says, go into all the world and make disciples, the emphasis of the verse is not simply the go. It's the making disciples. And as I was preparing the study, I was refreshing myself and going to other commentaries and other comments and all, and, and uh, I wanted to share a couple of thoughts about this. Again, in Matthew 28, 19, it says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. So I looked this up because one commentator said this, so I checked other sources and Greek sources and all to see whether or not he was accurate. 
and uh, indeed he was. The Greek word that is translated through the English word go in Matthew 28, 19, the Greek word can be translated go in an ongoing way. Go in an ongoing way. In other words, you are to continually be going is what Jesus is saying. So the disciples were to go, and they were to take the gospel out, even out of Israel. That's the whole point that's being made. It's not just to the Jewish people. Now you go into the world. So you're to take this out even beyond the borders of Israel. And it's an ongoing thing. It's something he's telling his men, and by application us, it's something they were to never stop doing. The word go can carry with it the inference of being compelled, compelled to continually go. Now, what would compel them to continually go? If he's saying go with the sense of compelling them to go, what would it be that would compel them from the inside to go? Well, one, it would be God's love for them and God's love for them to a world that is lost. And that would serve to compel them. They have been loved by God. And because God has loved them, they're compelled to tell others. You don't keep things to yourself that are good. When I got saved, I didn't keep it to myself. When I met the girl I married... I didn't keep that to myself. She wasn't my secret kind of side thing. Everybody knew, and everybody to this day knows, that I have a love for this particular woman, my wife, Marie. I didn't keep it to myself. I'm compelled in many ways to share that which is most dear to me. And so the gospel, you are compelled from the inside. Why? Because God has so loved you, and God has saved you. Why wouldn't you talk about him? Why isn't it natural for you to talk about them? Why wouldn't you? We talk about so many things. Talk about, for me, it's the Dodgers. For you, it's a losing team. <laughs> but we talk about sports. We talk about our jobs. We talk about relationships, as mentioned. We talk about our families. And it's natural, right? You don't kind of like have to make yourself talk about those things. Those are things that are spontaneous. Why is that? Because they're at the top of your list. Because those are the things that matter. Why wouldn't I talk about Jesus Christ? Why would I keep him to myself? Why would he be the best kept secret of my life? There's something that compels you. He loved you. He sent. He, he laid his life down for you. He forgave you. He blessed you. He's with you. He never leaves you. Why wouldn't I speak about him? See, so there's a compelling and Paul speaks about that himself. He said in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, the love of Christ compels us. It's not my love for him. It's love for me, his love for me. And that compels us. And so one of the things that causes us to, to speak is simply God's love. God's love that has, has been uh, taken in, if you will. God's love that has been revealed in the sacrifice of Jesus that has internally driven us to speak about him and to go. But there's also something very practical that you find in Scripture. What else would compel them to go? Well, it's interesting because one of the things that actually compelled them was persecution. You might find that interesting, but it's true. Persecution would arise and would be used by the Lord to compel them. You see, when the church was birthed at Pentecost... At first, the people who saw the church actually respected these believers. In Acts 2, 46 and 47, it says, with, with one accord, they continued to meet daily in the temple courts and to break bread from house to house, sharing their meals with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So at first, they enjoyed the favor of the people. They actually spoke well of them. But a short time after the church was birthed, the disciples began to be persecuted. Now, up until that time, they had remained in Jerusalem. But when the church began to be persecuted, they were actually compelled to leave. In Acts chapter 8, verse 1, that verse tells us that after 
Stephen was martyred, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they all were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And so one is the love of Christ compels us, but two, they actually, through persecution, were forced to leave Jerusalem and take the gospel out. So Jesus commanded them. He commanded them to go, and he even compelled them to do so. For them, the love of God would be the driving, the compelling force, but the persecution they experienced also drove them out of their comfort zone to preach. And so in Mark 16, verse 15, again, it says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So they were to leave Jerusalem in order that they might preach the gospel everywhere. They were to take God's word and communicate the word of God clearly. Now listen, they weren't to appeal to listeners' emotions. They were to appeal to their understanding. God working in them and through them was going to establish their credentials to be able to speak on his behalf. And so with this in mind, the commission Jesus gave them is one of making disciples, not just going, but going with a purpose. They have a purpose. The purpose is to leave and make disciples. It's not just going out. It's laboring in ministry to produce disciples. What's a disciple? A disciple is someone who believes in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, intentionally learns from him, and strives to live more like him. So Jesus wasn't only sending them out, but sending them out with a purpose. They were to go into the world to make lifelong learners of Jesus Christ. They were to go into the world and produce lifetime pupils of Jesus and his message. Now, why is that important? It's important because making disciples is the most effective way to evangelize and to thrive. So as they go, when they go, where they go, they are to make disciples. And they're to make disciples, not deciders. That's an important point. Sometimes we speak about making a decision for Christ. I understand the terminology. I've used it. But the emphasis is not making deciders. Because I've seen over the course of many years that sometimes people will raise a hand or come forward at an invitation who have no intent at all of following the Lord. They just, through an emotional reason or perhaps they're going through a crisis of some sort, and they think, well, I'm going to try God. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. It, it, it only, you only become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ when you completely give up, die to yourself, and receive him as Lord and Savior. When you say, I can't make it, I will not make it, I need you. You don't add God to the, to the, to the hodge, hodgepodge of beliefs. He becomes the center of everything, you see. And so when, when we go out to make a disciple, it's not so that we can have spiritual scalps that we count and say, oh, 65 people got saved today because they gave an invitation. It's when they go on and produce disciples themselves that you know that the seed actually took. That's how that works. And so these are men who are supposed to go out and they're supposed to encourage people to become disciples. A lot of times, I, I'll, I'll, read, I'll, I'll say this, I don't have it in my notes, but it comes to mind. When our church first began, I began to read several books. You know, I wanted to get some insight from other people who have planted churches and do evangelism. And one of the people that I used was an expert on, on evangelism and church growth. And so I thought I could learn from him. So I read his material, a book. And he pointed out, now this was again 40 plus years ago. He, he pointed out that, he said, in the Billy Graham organization, which by the way, I highly regard Billy Graham and, 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 and also, this is not in any way a discredit to him, but I found it interesting, and it's what helped to form my, my mentality. This, this fella did a lot of research on the invitations and the amount of people who, quote-unquote, made decisions, because that's the way it's, made, it's, it's stated. There's even a magazine called Decision Magazine. So he was saying, we did a lot of follow-up, and, and they pointed out that in Evangelistic Crusades, out of the 100% who come forward, 90% of those are actually Christians who are simply going forward to rededicate themselves. 90%. He said within that 100%, there's 10%. The 10% that you see going up to receive Christ, out of that, a smaller percentage actually are being saved. So in fact, if you have 100 people who went forward, 
90 of them were already Christians. And then out of the 10 left, almost half of them will walk away. We in the United States, because we're production-oriented, like to say, well, look at all the people who went forward. I, as a pastor, say, but how many of them continued to go? See, making a disciple is more than having someone make a decision. Making a disciple is to teach them. I'll show you this in a minute in the commission. So that they go forward, and you know when they're a disciple, when they begin to multiply by bringing other people to faith in Christ. That's when they become a disciple. And that's the most ev evangelistic thing that you can do. That's the most edifying thing that can happen. Now, these men had been with Jesus and spent years with Jesus being mentored by him. They were called by him. They were taught by him. They served with him. They heard his words. They received his explanations. They, they watched how he ministered. They spent quite a bit of time with him. They were witnesses of his amazing thing, the amazing things that he did. They saw him turn water into wine, multiply fish and loaves. They saw him cleanse lepers, forgive sins, heal the paralyzed. They saw him restore sight to the blind, heal the deaf, enable the mute to speak, calm the storms, cast out demons, walk on water, and, and even read, raise the dead to life. And they also knew that he himself had been raised from the dead so they'd been prepared for this by Christ, and now they're being commissioned. They're to go, both by internal compelling, even outside persecution. So again, as they went, while they went, where they went, they were to make disciples. And it isn't just the going, it's the fruit that they are to produce, which is disciples. They were to teach people to love Christ and to make disciples of all the nations. And that's, that's why, even as I mentioned a moment ago, that's why uh, these kinds of things, and this particular portion of Scripture has, uh, has, has been the foundation that we as a church have, have built on. We're, we're to teach the Word to make disciples. And that's what makes up what we call our four pillars, the Word, worship, witness, and witness. Everything is centered on making disciples, and everything is, is centered on those four particular pillars. And so we're to go out and do that. Now notice in verse 16, he says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So he says, he who believes and is baptized. He didn't say he who is baptized. This is where a lot of people have an argument. He didn't say he, the one who's baptized. He said the one who believes. Believers are followers of the Lord in baptism because they believe and are saved. The outer emblem of regeneration, the outer emblem of that hidden faith is, is baptism. Baptism is a symbol of what is called regeneration or being born again. Water baptism symbolizes our death and resurrection in Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Well, Romans 6, verses 3 through 5. Paul said, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. So when water baptism takes place, it's actually an illustration of death, burial, and resurrection. And I share this every time we perform baptism. The water symbolizes a grave. When you go down into it, it symbolizes death and burial. When you come out of it, it symbolizes life and resurrection. And so when you're water baptized, when you were water baptized, if you were, you went down into the water, death and burial. You did that through faith. That's why we don't baptize infants. Because infants only believe one thing. They're hungry or they're wet. They don't believe in Christ. And my faith doesn't save somebody else. There's no such thing as proxy faith. My faith can't save my wife. I only have enough faith for myself. And so there's no proxy faith at all. You have to be water baptized by faith in Christ. So when you were water baptized, when you went down into the water, you were symbolizing as a, an outer testimony to the world. You were saying to them, I believe in Jesus Christ. 
I am dead and buried in him. Now, there's something about burial that is so final. You can have a hope, especially in the early days before they were practicing universally embalming and all. You could have a hope that somehow life would once again, uh, you know, that person would actually not be dead but would be alive. In, in earlier days in American history, I believe it was American history, in earlier days, there were, there were people who actually were drinking water out of lead cups. Most of you probably already know this. But, and they would get lead poisoning, and people didn't know that at that time. So they buried them. And sometimes the, 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 the place that they were buried, sometimes they would reuse that. And so they would open the lid or whatever of the coffin, and, and they would find fingernails that were torn off of hands, and they would find scratch marks against... This is a true story. I don't mean to be morbid, but it's true. They would find scratch marks and they discovered that they were burying living people so they drilled a hole and they would put a wire and it had a, a, a bell and that's where the term saved by the bell came from did you know that it's not a boxing term they would pull the bell and you had somebody who was in another room waiting to see if the bell was rung, and he was pulling graveyard. That's where that came from. Just a little bit, not from the Bible, but interesting, right? <laughs> Raining cats and dogs? No, I, I can go on. <laughs> you know what that was? Raining cats and dogs. People used to make on their, on their houses, they were low, and they had mud, and they had hay. When cats and dogs would climb on top of it, when it rained... It turned to mud. The cats and dogs would fall off, and the people said, it's raining cats and dogs. I can go on, I won't. I'm just trying to make a point. Why'd I do that? I forgot what I was saying. Oh, yeah. Water baptism doesn't save you. It's, well... In 1 Peter 3.21, it says, The baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter, again, chapter 3, verse 21. Baptism doesn't save you. You are baptized because you are saved. So Jesus is not saying you have to be baptized to be saved. Because I want you to notice what he says, and I'll say it again. Notice verse 16. First it says, he who believes and is baptized. It doesn't say he who is baptized and believes. He who believes and is baptized. Why? Because faith saves you. Faith in Jesus Christ. Now, in Matthew 28, 19, we, we have a command, he says, to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, when it speaks of the name, that speaks of the name of God, which is a, a revelation to us of who he is. So baptism is to reveal that through regeneration, we have a new relationship with God. And the union of these three names, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three names for the one God, is a proof of equality of the Godhead. You see in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, where Paul says it like this. He said, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So it's showing us the unity of the Godhead, and you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, because the uh, apostles were going into Gentile lands, they would baptize not with certain formula, but with they'd say they were baptized in the name of Jesus. That's not saying that it was Jesus only. It's saying that they were baptized in his name because they came to be, believe in him and were saved by him. That's what that point is being made in that particular way that it says it, especially through the book of Acts. And so how do converts become disciples? What keeps a church from being a crowd? Well, it's the teaching and the observing of all things that Jesus commanded. Observing, he said, all things. Because in Matthew 28, verse 20, it says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So the observing of all things is another way of saying, 
a systematic knowledge and teaching of the Word of God. And so believers are to be taught the gospel and about the ministry of Christ, and they're to know the Word of God and to be encouraged to obey it. It's through the proper teaching, the correct teaching of Scripture, that believers will grow. And that's why, again, our philosophy here is to teach through books of the Bible. In Acts 20, verse 27, Paul said it like this. He was speaking to some elders from a church, the church of Ephesus. He was in a, a port city called Miletus. And, and he said to them, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I've taught you that A to Z, you know it all. And that's what it's all about. We're, we're supposed to know the Word. So teaching God's Word is intended to protect believers and encourage believers to grow, protect them from deception and encourage their growth in Christ. Teaching God's Word is intended to instill biblical understanding in the believer. And that's why in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, the apostle said, I will always remind you of these things even though you know them and are established in the truth you now have. Can't you tell me something new? Can't you tell me something fresh? Can't you give? No, he said, I'm going to give you the essentials. Why? Because it's on the essentials that you build your faith. And from there, you learn to communicate it and understand how it works properly in the world that you live in. Deception is the earmark of the last days. It's spoken of often in Scripture. In 2 Timothy, I'll give you an example. Chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. You must continue in these things. Why? Because deception is rampant. Even in the earlier days of the church, there were people who were preaching false things about God and Christ and the work of the Spirit. So Jesus intended his followers to become fully mature. Again, their faith is not based on their instincts, their opinions, or their desires. Their faith is built on the foundation of the Word of God. Their faith is to be built on the rock of his Word, a, a Word that strengthens us, and it's the Word of God that develops our faith. Again, in Acts 20, verse 32, Paul was saying to these same elders, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Again, there's a, a bit of an interest in the Jesus movement through Greg's movie and all and things of that nature. That's what made this Jesus movement in my lifetime in my experience, a powerful revival, but it was undermined. I'm hoping and praying that God will do the work that he's done, not the same word, but do a work. I'm praying that he'll do that built on the word of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, but it got undermined. And let me tell you one thing that's a bit controversial to say, controversial to say for some people, but I think it's true and I might as well say it. Um, I won't say it second service, I'll just say it to you. Now, what, what is it? And I don't want to give you a history lesson, but I will say this. When I got saved in 1970. I was 20 years old. Within around six years, those who do uh, church history research, you, you can find this anywhere if you're interested in it, but those who have chronicled the works of the Spirit in the church from ancient church history to the present will tell you that the Jesus, quote-unquote, Jesus movement, many, many of these who are of that scholarly sort will say that it... It, it began in like 68, 69, they'll say, and then it, it came to its end, they'll say, which I don't believe it's come to its end. Jesus hasn't stopped moving. But they'll say the height of it stopped in around 76, 77. What happened in that day? You know what happened? And I'll tell you the truth. There was a brother whom I highly regard, hardly regard his memory, highly regarded him as a minister of the, of the gospel. I, I regarded and respected him very much, Jerry Falwell. Some, of, some people hated him. I saw him as, as a strong leader, and I appreciated his ministry. So this is no, a negative towards him at all, but I'll tell you what happened. He got involved. He got, he got the church involved in a political message, and when he did that, the power of the Spirit began to diminish. Why? Because we started preaching politics and not the gospel. I saw that happen. I have strong political opinions. I'll bring them up once in a while, of course. I should. I should. But I've never lost sight of the fact that, the, uh, that politics don't change your life. Jesus does. I've never forgotten that. I, 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 I just haven't. And so with that said, we have to be aware of that. And a second thing was the proliferation of, of, of um, TV ministries, radio ministries, and now we have the proliferation of quote-unquote ministries on, on the Internet. 
And, and in, in the past, somebody could have an odd belief that he was teaching from his pulpit, but it was pretty much localized. It would stay within the confines of his city or perhaps his, perhaps his region. But now that person can get on TV or that person can get on, on radio or that person can uh, go on the social network. And, and the proliferation of those things now is just exponential. Whereas before it could be dealt with, now it's just out there. It's like letting it out. And that's what's taking place too. And what happened in that is false doctrine began to expand nationwide. Is that something we shouldn't have been prepared for? No, we are prepared. Acts 20, 29, and 30. I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. So it's the teaching of the whole counsel of God that produces disciples. And finally, I'll close with verses 17 and 18. What these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They'll cast out demons. They'll speak in new tongues with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Verse 17, these signs will follow. That's important. It doesn't say... Believers will follow these signs. It says these signs will follow believers. Keep that in mind, please. Because there are a lot of Christians who follow the signs. And sometimes the signs are taking them where they're not supposed to go. So these signs will follow the believers. It doesn't say these believers will follow those signs. That's a very simple thing I just told you. But if you take that to heart, you'll be safeguarded. Because there's a lot of people, how come you don't this and how come you don't do that? Because that's not scriptural. That's why we don't do that. And so he speaks concerning these, these things. Believers, he said, will cast out demons. Believers will speak with new tongues. You saw that at Pentecost. They're going to pick up or take up serpents. And uh, that finds in, I find that interesting because some of you have seen these snake handlers. They're out there da, 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 with the snake and this and that. Then they die. Um, <laughs> In Matthew 28, 3 through 6, Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on fire, a viper, driven out of the heat, fastened itself on his hand. When the, when the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects, and the people expected to, him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said, he's a god. That's interesting, fickle-minded people. He's a demon. No, he's a god. You know, that's the way people think. But it actually happened in the ministry, and that's like a, a portent or a prophecy that that thing, and we see it in Scripture. Well, if they drink anything deadly, that speaks of supernatural protection. They'll lay hands on the sick, and they'll recover you see that often in the book of Acts. And by the way, that's why we do pray for the sick. And the point that he's making is take this gospel and proclaim it to all the nations. In Luke 24, 48, it says, beginning in the city of Jerusalem, take the gospel out to the world. Now, one last thought, and we'll close. There are those who say, what useless information, what childish mythology, why do you teach fables? It does you no good. The gospel's out of... Uh, out of uh, sync with modern culture. It has nothing that it does that's any good that we haven't already done. And I remembered a story, so I just wrote it down so I could write, uh, say it right. In what was once called French Indonesia, a commentator was viewing sites that at one time were used for cannibal rites. As he did so, he made a comment. Uh, he made a comment to one of the inhabitants that it was just too bad that missionaries had come and messed up their culture. So the native pointed to a rock and asked him if he knew what that rock was. And this commentator said, no, I don't. So the native said, well, that's the rock that prisoners were executed on. Uh, we would lay their heads on the rock and we would crush it with a hammer. And then we'd eat their brains. And then he went on to say, if the missionaries had not come, you'd be my dinner. And so, I think the gospel has done a lot of good in the world. And I'm pretty sure this commentator would be grateful.
that these people messed up their culture because their culture was eating human brains. Why did I tell you that? Just felt like it. <laughs> the gospel does a lot of good. May we make sure we take it out. Take the gospel out. Not your opinions. Not your political persuasion. But Jesus Christ. Let's make sure we do that.